unit three, which is muscles. Uh, so what we're going to do in lab, which we started yesterday and we'll continue tomorrow, is looking at the major muscles associated, skeletal muscles with the, the body. And so what we want to do today in lecture one is go through a pattern by which the muscles have been named. So even though when you look at the muscle names, it looks like they're Greek or Latin, which they are. Uh, there was actually a reason for it in that uh, they were descriptive. And so well, what made it easier for me to learn is if I understood what the words were describing, then I knew what to look for in the muscle, and sometimes it, it would really help. And then once we've done that, we're going to start looking at uh, muscle tissue and the three types of muscle tissue that we have in our bodies, so skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle unique to the heart, and then smooth muscle, and talk about uh, the function of those three types of tissue. <coughs> so, so yesterday in lecture, uh, in lab, we, we began to think about the idea of the fact that muscles span between bones, and the muscle has a tendon on one bone and a tendon on the other bone. So what we've actually done is use the idea of an origin and an insertion to describe the tendons that attach to bones. And then the pattern is that when we say an origin, we're talking about the bone that would be stationary during any contraction of the muscle. And the insertion then is the attachment of the other end of the muscle by <coughs> to the bone that's actually going to move. And then the action is the action that occurs at the insertion. So, so the three all go together. So one of the muscles we're going to look at tomorrow in lab is one of the larger muscles of your of your brachium in the anterior surface, which is the biceps brachii. Okay. So the action of the biceps brachii is to flex the lower arm or antebrachium. So if that's the case, then this becomes the insertion because it's on the moving bone, the radius, and this would be the origin because it's on a fixed bone. So the idea of origin, insertion, and action all go together. And all fibers can do, if you look at fiber patterns in muscle, is they shorten toward the origin, which actually creates the action. So when you're studying them on uh, the, the uh, models in lab, then pay attention to the direction in which they have uh, sculptured fibers in the, and then that'll help you with action as well. So I think when you're learning, Origin action insertion. If you look at that as a as a unit of information, it will help you do it. And so, if we were to be more precise, then when we're looking at the biceps brachii, then uh, it actually has two tendons of origin, which is where the name biceps comes from, because there are two. Uh, so it'd be the coracoid process, or what we would call the short head, and then the upper lip of the glenoid fossa for the long head. So we have two tendons on the stationary bone, which is the scapula. And then the tendon of insertion attaches to the radial tuberosity, which was the larger we learned on the radius. So that when the muscles are shortened toward the origin, it actually pulls the radial tuberosity upward and allows us to flex our arm. Right? So when you think about origin, action, insertion, that's kind of good way to think about it. Just look at it as a block of, of tissue that's all related to one another. So the other thing we worked at in lab yesterday was the fact that we have these tendons that attach a muscle to bone on either end. So the fleshy part of the muscle that contains the muscle cells that are contraction are, are referred to as a belly. So we have a belly and then we have, in this case, the tendon of origin, the two tendons of origin down here. And a tendon of insertion out there. So if we look at the, all of the names on your or on your list of lab of muscles that we're going to work on, all of the names have been or have been uh, developed using kind of a protocol. So some muscles are named because of the direction their fibers flow, and the name tells you.
something unique about uh, the direction in which the fibers will be found in the muscle. Uh, other parts of muscle names tell you the size of the muscle, whether it's a large muscle or a small muscle. Uh, there's some geometry that was used in naming, so some muscles are named based upon some ge geometric terms that we use. Some muscles nicely tell you their action in their name, and their, their action is part of their name. Other muscles tell you the number of origins. For example, the one we just did, biceps, tells you there are two origins. Uh, and then some are done simply by location, where, where they're located on the body. And then some, some are done by origin insertion as part of the muscle name. And then what we'll see is that a couple of these uh, characteristics can be used collectively to uh, actually name uh, a muscle uh, in, a, in an effective way. So if we're looking at direction of fibers, then if we want to describe the fibers as running parallel to some ideal midline, then we would say the word rectus as a, as a way to indicate those parallel fibers. Uh, we could have fibers running perpendicular to the midline and then we would use the word transverse in the name itself. And we could have fibers running at an angle to the midline, and then we would use the word oblique. So yesterday in lab, we, we saw all three of these characteristics used in the muscles we, we looked at. So for example, the muscle that's the most anterior in our, on our abdomen, uh, fibers run perfectly parallel to the midline, so it's a rectus muscle. And then the second part of the name is a location, telling you exactly where it's located on the body. So rectus abdominis tells us that the fiber is going to run parallel to the midline and it's in the abdominal region. So it's a paired muscle on either side of the midline. Um, so rectus abdominis. We also have a muscle in our thigh that's done the same way, where the fibers run parallel to the midline, so rectus and then location name. So this would be the rectus femoris, or femoris, because it's associated <coughs> with the femoral region of the body, and the fibers are running parallel to the midline. So there are two examples of rectus muscles that, that we can look at. There's only really one transverse muscle that's on your list, and it's the deepest of the three side muscles of the abdomen. Uh, and so it's the innermost muscle, which is the transversus abdominis. So again, it's incorporating fiber direction plus location as a way to describe the muscle. And so the fibers run on a transverse plane from the edge of your body toward the fascia associated with the rectus abdominis. And so this fascia is what it connects into. And then it compresses your abdomen brings your abdomen inward. Right. So that would be the, the only rectus muscle there, I mean transversus muscle that's on your list. Then we have a couple of obliques, ones that we did in the eye yesterday, and then ones we did on the abdomen. So if we look at the side muscles over at abdominal wall again, we actually have two that run at angles, and they run at opposite angles of one another. So we have the external oblique, which is our most superficial muscle, and the internal oblique, which is an in-between muscle, so that our side walls of our abdomen are actually comprised by three muscles, external oblique, internal oblique, and then transverse abdominis, whereas the only muscle anteriorly on the abdomen is the rectus abdominis, which runs parallel. And then there's quite a bit of connective tissue interacting to keep those muscles kind of uh, connected to one. So if we're looking at size, we use some pairings uh, that uh, are pretty precisely. So if we use the word maximus to describe the large muscle, then we would use the word minimus to describe the small muscle. Conversely, if we use the word major to describe the large muscle, then we would use the word minor to describe the small muscle. So, the way it was done is maximus and minimus we see usually associated with the hips. And then major and minor is more commonly used with the shoulders. So kind of the, the major muscles of the hips 
and minor muscle, major muscles of the shoulder and minor muscle. This is the kind of the pattern we're going to see in the body. And then uh, if we have a long muscle and a short muscle, then the long muscle would incorporate longest in its name, and then the short muscle would incorporate gravis in its name. So we're going to have a long muscle, short muscle combination. And then these two are kind of ones that are used, uh, can be used. Uh, in, in conjunction with, uh, with some of the other characteristics that we've talked about, like Magnus could be used with minor. Uh, so Magnus is a large muscle in the group. And then the one we're going to see then is in thigh muscles. We're going to see the word Magnus incorporated into some of our large thigh muscles. And then latissimus is the widest muscle in the group. And we're going to see that incorporated on a muscle on our back where latissimus is used, which means really wide. And then vastus means greater large muscle. And we're going to see that incorporated on thigh muscles as well. So there's kind of a pattern to it where we're going to see this associated with hips. We're going to see this associated with uh, actually the thigh and the arm. Uh, latissimus is going to be associated with the back. Magnus with the thigh. Major with the shoulders and vastus with the thigh. So if we look at the muscles that form our gluteal region, uh, and our buttocks region, then the largest muscle uh, is called the gluteus for location in the gluteal region of the body and maximus for its characteristic. And so it's being cut here. And so it originates on the, on the sacrum and the iliac crest and crosses over to the femur to near the greater trochan group. So it's actually been cut, uh, the gluteus maximus. And then what we would see is that there's a small muscle, uh, and so it's the muscle right here that sits against the outside wall of the ilium, uh, coming off the iliac crest and going to the greater trochan. So it's the gluteus minimus. And then the one that's been cut right here is a muscle that's in between, so it's called the gluteus Medius. So we actually have three gluteal muscles, the maximus, which is the largest, the minimus, which is the smallest, and then medius, which is in between. And they overlap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The medius is actually cut. It actually comes off. It, 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 it essentially overlies the minimus. Uh, it comes off the iliac crest a little higher and goes down to uh, the greater trochanter as well. So what we'll see because of direction of fibers of these two compared to this one, is these two share axons are almost identically. Uh, and then this one's going to have a slightly different axon as well as, well as sharing axons with the other two because of the slightly different pattern of fibers. So we have um, three muscles in our leg that bring our leg toward the midline. So that action of bringing a body part to the midline is a abduction. Okay. So what we're going to have then are three muscles that use the word adductor. So we're going to use action of the muscle. And then we're going to use size characteristics of the muscle. So we're going to have one muscle that's really large, one muscle that is long, and one muscle that is short. So we'll end up with the large muscle being the adductor magnus, which is a deep muscle and a very large muscle in your eye. So this is all the adductor magnus that we're seeing here and then up there. And then if we look more superficially, then in our growing area, we have a muscle called the adductor longus, because it's the longest muscle in the group. And then if we cut the adductor longus, which was being cut here, we have a muscle that's deep to it, that's shorter, which is the adductor brevis. And so all of those muscles actually are going to adduct the thigh, bring the thigh in. So if you were rollerblading or skate skiing, where you're doing that action, if you haven't done it for a while, then the insides of your thighs kill you the next day. So the, the, the adductor works through uh, while you're doing your activities. So again, longest brevis that we just talked about. All right, so now if we look at the back, then we have a muscle that has a really wide tendon. Uh, 
starting at, at the seven uh, thoracic vertebrae uh, and connecting to all the vertebral spines through the lumbar region and then continuing down into the sacrum. So the muscle itself has this enormously large, broad tendon of, of origin. And so that's why it gets the name latissimus for being a very wide muscle. And what the muscle is going to do is it's going to taper as it goes upward. And it's actually going to cross in your armpit over to the humerus. And it's going to insert on the medial lip of the bicipital groove or the intertubecular groove that we talked about on the humerus. So the muscle is one that you would use if you went to a gym and pulled weights downward like this. You're using the latissimus dorsi. Or if you grabbed a bar and pulled your body weight up, as in doing the chin up, then the latissimus dorsi is one of the major muscles involved in that process. And the way it does it is have this enormous origin on your back and then tapering to a specific point on your humerus where it actually moves uh, the humerus. So it gets its name latissimus for being wide. And then the second part of the word, dorsi, is telling you where it's the widest. So latissimus dorsi, wide on the dorsal surface. So very descriptive of, of that part of the muscle. So when we look at the, the chest and the pectoral nerve, uh, we have muscles that attach to the clavicle and the scapula and uh, and the sternum and the clavicle that kind of bridge between your axial skeleton and your humerus. So the biggest muscle on the anterior chest surface is this one. So uh, it's going to use a location name, so pectoral region. Pectoral girdle is what's used for your shoulder. So it's going to be called the pectoralis because it's in that region. And then major because it's the large muscle group. And it actually has two heads which are the origin, so it has a sternal origin coming off of the body of the sternum and the manubrium. Then it has a smaller piece that comes off the clavicle at the top. So we think of it as the sternal head and the clavicular head. And then it tapers and crosses the anterior aspect of your armpit and attaches to the lateral lip of the bicycle group. So it's a muscle that pulls your arms inward like this. So the pectoralis major. And then underlying it would be the small muscle of the group. Uh, so in this picture, we see the pectoralis major is being cut so that we can actually see the muscle underlying it. Then we have this muscle that arises on rib three, four, and five. So that's its origin. And the muscle crosses to the coracoid process on the scapula itself. And so since it's in the same region, pectoralis, it's a, it's a small muscle, pectoralis minor. All right. And so this is a muscle that is going to help stabilize and move the scapula, but it also can reverse, seem to reverse its origin insertion when we think about its respiratory function. So there are a couple of muscles in your body where origin insertion uh, can be altered based upon action. So vastus muscles then were, were, the, were large muscles. And so our thigh is comprised of three vastus muscles on the anterior compartment. Uh, and they are involved in extending your hip, uh, flexing your hip and extending your knee. And so we have the rectus femoris, uh, which we've already talked about, which is the anterior muscle. And of the muscles we're going to talk about in the anterior compartment of the thigh, it's the only muscle that actually crosses two joints. So it's going to have a unique action compared to its muscles that it's associated with. So the rectus femoris uh, origin is the anterior inferior iliac spine. So since it's actually attached to the ilium, it crosses the hip joint. And then its insertion is the tendon of quadriceps via the patella, and then what keeps the patella in place is the patellar, patellar ligament. So because of this relationship of the tendon, the patella, and the patellar ligament, then it actually crosses the knee joint, uh, and the patellar ligament's attached to the tibial tuberosity. So this muscle crosses two joints, the hip and the knee. So when you're looking at its actions, 
you're going to see it has a greater range of actions than its muscles that are associated with it, which are the vastus muscles. And so we have three vastus muscles, which are going to use the word vastus because they're large, and then a, a location descriptor for them. So the one on the inside of your thigh here is the vastus medialis, because it's on the medial muscle. The one on the outside of the thigh is the vastus lateralis. And then if we cut the rectus femoris and look under it, then we would see vastus intermedius in between, meaning between the other two. So all of these muscles do not cross the hip joint because they all originate <coughs> off of the femur. And so they won't have any hip action. Uh, and then they all come together into the quadriceps tendon uh, and again attached to the tibial tuberosity via the patellar ligaments. So when we look at that, we, we call them the quads, where this name comes from, the quadriceps tendon, because quad is four. So it's the fact that the vastus medialis, vastus lateralis, vastus intermedius, and rectus femoris all attach to this tendon. And so that's why they get the name the quads. All right, so we have some ge geometric shapes that we also use for naming uh, muscles. So uh, we have a muscle in our shoulder called the deltoid, and it gets its name because it's very triangular shape, having a broad or and a refined point where it inserts on the humerus. On our back, we have a muscle called the trapezius because it looks trapezoid. So the, the confusing thing about that is probably a lot of these names were done on animals. And the, the orientation of that muscle is slightly different on a four-legged animal because of the fact that they're using their arms differently than we use ours standing erect. So when we look at it, you have to look at both sides to, to be able to see the trapezoid uh, shape to it. The serratus is going to be a muscle that is associated with your ribs, crosses over to the humerus, and it gets its name because it originates off of your first eight ribs. And because it attaches to each rib, it has little finger-like projections that give it a serrated edge anteriorly. So its name is actually going to tell you that. The rhomboids are some muscles in your back that are going to help attach the scapula to the axial skeleton. Uh, and we get the name rhomboid because a rhomboid is a diamond shape. And so they're diamond shaped like a card gun uh, on a deck of cards. Ovicularis uh, is a name we use for muscles that have a round pattern of fiber, circular pattern of fiber. Pectinate uh, is a muscle we have in our drawing and it's really hard to see. Uh, and we're going to see the word used when we do the heart in next quarter. But it gets its name because it has little fibers that attach uniquely on the bone. So they look like the tines of a comb, uh, the way they attach. So pectinate means comb-like or shape. And it definitely it refers to the tines on the comb, the way the tines are. Clacky is just a word for flat. So we're going to see that incorporated in a muscle in the neck that we did yesterday, the platysma. And then quadratus would be square or four-sided. And then gracilis is a word that refers to slender, a very slender muscle. So if we kind of look at those, the deltoid is a muscle in our shoulder, and it's the fleshy part of our shoulder right here. So the deltoid actually comes off of the, the distal third of the clavicle, the acromion process, and the distal third of the scapular spine. So it's actually coming off right here and going all the way around to about here. Uh, and so what we do is we divide it into uh, different regions. So the part on the clavicle is called the anterior deltoid. The part coming off the acromion is called the middle deltoid. And then the part coming off the scapular spine is called the posterior deltoid. And that's because the, the one on the acromion only has one action, which is abduction. But when we look at the anterior, because the fibers are on a different angle, it can not only abduct, but it can flex. And then the posterior deltoid, because it's at an angle back here, 
can not only add up, but it can expand. So when we look at the deltoid, there's a fuller range of motion because it has subunits or, or parts to it. And so what we're seeing here is the posterior deltoid, looking at this posterior view, and then the middle deltoid right here. So you can see how it's coming off the scapular spine and the chromium process. And then it, its insertion is a roughened area on the lateral aspect of the humus right here that we learned, which was the deltoid tuberosity. So the trapezius, as I said, looks trapezoid if you look at both sides. So the trapezius is this muscle and this muscle on left and right. So you put them together, it looks like a trapezoid. Uh, and again, it's a muscle that has different origins from different points. And therefore, we divide it into an upper tract, which attaches to the spherical line and then a ligament that runs down the, the vertebrae spinous processes called the neutral ligament. And then it arises or originates from thoracic vertebrae uh, spinous processes as well. So it crosses and goes over to the scapular spine. So what we do is we, since these fibers going up where you say this is the upper trap, these fibers are going transverse, so we call that the middle trap. And then these fibers are going downward, so we see, so we call that the lower trap. So what we're going to see is a common action for all three subunits of the trap, and then unique actions for the upper and lower trap because of the way the fibers actually run. So when you're looking at the action, that's the kind of the pattern that you're going to see. So the serratus anterior is really kind of a cool muscle in that it, ridges, it originates on the first eight ribs here. Uh, and it gets the same serratus because you have these little points of attachment on the ribs. So when you look at it, it looks like little fingers like this with a serrated edge. And then what it's going to do is it's going to, it's going to cross underneath your armpit, go in front of the scapula uh, where the subscapular fossa is, and then insert on the uh, vertebral border of the scapula anteriorly. So that when the serratus anterior contracts, since this is its origin, then the scapula is what's going to move. So it contracts <coughs> the scapula and brings the scapula forward, forward like that. So, so its name comes from the fact that it's serrated on the anterior surface. So serratus anterior telling us where the serrated surface part of the muscle is. So the rhomboids are muscles that are cut in this picture. Uh, and so they actually are going to originate off of lower cervical and upper thoracic spinous processes. And then they insert on the vertebral <coughs> border of the scapula, and they run at an angle so that they go up like this, go up like that, and so the two of them together look like a diamond on a part of it. And so the lower one is the larger muscle, the upper one is the smaller muscle, so rhomboides major as the larger muscle, and then rhomboides minor as the smaller muscle, and then they, they actually bring your scapula toward the midline, like this, so they adduct the scapula, bring the scapula to the midline of the body. So the obicularis muscles that we looked at in lab history was a muscle that was around the eye that closes your eyes, so obicularis oculi, and then a muscle that was around our lips, uh, and they close the lips or perch the lips as in kissing, so obicularis oris. And again, obicular tells us that the fibers run in a circular pattern. So most obicular muscles are always going to be associated with an opening, that they're going to decrease the size of the opening. So the pectinate muscle, uh, which is comb-like, is a growing muscle, uh, so the pectineus. And it is actually going to originate on the pubic bone and the superior pubic ramus right here. Mm -hmm. And it's actually going to cross to uh, a line on the, on the femur, which is actually called the pectinate line. The 
that it's actually going to attach to. Uh, and so it crosses the groin area. And it's a muscle that if, if you overstrain, it creates quite a bit of growing pain uh, in certain pectinate muscles. And again, it's really hard to see it, but the way you would see it as a pectinate muscle is you would have to cut all the muscle away so you can see how it's attaching actually to the femur. And then you would see that it has these kind of tendinous fibers that attach in a pattern like this that look like the tines of the foot, which is where it gets, where it gets. So platysma is a very flat muscle. So again, we have this very flat muscle in the anterior compartment of our neck. It's just right underneath the skin. So uh, it's going to come off of the, the clavicle and sternum. And then it's going to insert on some fascia associated with the mandible. So when, you, when it contracts, it raises like this. You can see it uh, in, in your anterior compartment. Since it's very thin and flat, platysma. Then quadratus is square. So we incorporate the word quadratus lumborum. Uh, and it's a muscle that's one of the deepest uh, uh, back muscles. So it's actually easier to see by looking from the anterior part of the body through the abdominal, abdominal cavity, which is what we're doing here. And it comes off the iliac crest right here and goes up to the 12th rib. So it's very rectangular in shape. So the quadratus, because of its four-sided rectangular pattern, and then laborum, because it crosses the lumbar region uh, from the iliac crest to the 12th rib. And then gracilis is a slender muscle. So we have a very slender muscle that is on our inner thigh. Uh, and it runs from the pubic bone all the way down to uh, the knee area here. So it's kind of interesting because if you look at its action, it's an adduction. So I thought it was always interesting that we we named the muscles adductor magnus, adductor longus, and then deep adductor longus would be the one, the short one, adductor brevis. So it would have made sense to me if we would have said adductor gracilis. And then it would have been named for action plus shape of the muscle. The slender adductor. Yeah. But for some reason, the adductor part got dropped off. So this is called the silk. Yeah. Right. So the muscles that are helpful in terms of, of action are the ones that are named for what they do. So flexors would be muscles that would decrease in the angle of the joint. And so in our arms in particular, we're going to see muscles called flexors that are going to flex the wrist and flex the fingers. And then in our feet, we're going to have muscles called flexors that flex the, the toes and the big toe or the hollows. So we're going to see a pattern of, uh, particularly in our hands and feet, using that. And then if this is, if the muscles on this surface are flexors because they flex the wrist and flex the fingers, then the muscles on this surface are going to be extenders and they're going to extend the wrist and extend the fingers. And then the pattern on the foot is the flexors are on the carousel dorsal surface of the foot. So they would bring your toes upward like this. And then the extensors are going to be on the back of the lower leg cross under the plantar surface of the foot, and they're the ones that curl your toes uh, downward. And so the, so the extensors are top, the flexors are in the bottom of your foot. So we have abductors and adductors. So adductors move the bone away from the body, adductors move it toward the body. So we just looked at a bunch of adductors that were in our thigh. And then levator is to produce an upward movement. Uh, and so we have levators associated with our lips. We have levators associated with our scapula. And we have the levator in our pelvis that we learned yesterday associated with our anus. And then depressors would have the opposite action as a levator. So with our lips, we have levators that, that pull our lips upward, and we have depressors that pull our lips downward that we looked at yesterday. Uh, supinators and pronators are uniquely associated 
with the arm. And so the muscle that allows you to roll your hand this way is a supinator. The muscle that allows you to roll your arm this way is a pronator. So we're going to see supinators and pronators associated with our, our lower arm. And then the word opicularis means the fibers run in a circle. If we wanted to describe that same muscle because it closes an opening, then we would call it a sphincter. So typically what we did is we used the opicularis for our head and sphincters for our lower parts of our body. So, so we did the external anal sphincter. So we could have, could have had a sphincter or a sphincter oculi, but instead of opicularis. And then tensor is a little tiny muscle on the upper part of your hip here that attaches to a really broad sheet of connective tissue. So when it contracts, it makes that, that connective tissue really rigid. So it makes the outsides of your thigh really rigid. So it gets the name tensor because it makes the body part rigid. And then we, we have some rotators that allow us to rotate them around an axis. And I, I didn't put any rotators actually on your lips. So flexors, again, are going to be ones that are associated with the anterior aspect of the arm. And what we're going to do is we're just going to say, well, what are they flexing? And so the name is going to be the action flexion and then tell you that it's actually going, why it's going to flex. So for example, we have a flexor carpi radialis and a flexor carpi ulnaris. So the name flexor carpi is for the ribs. It's telling you it's going to flex the ribs. And then the the ulnaris and radialis are locations. So if it's on the thumb side, it's going to be radialis. And if it's on the little finger side, it's going to be ulnaris. So it's helping you understand that we can actually flex this because we have a muscle over here and a muscle over here that's pulling on the wrist itself. And then if we moved away from there, what you would see is that we can, if it's going to be the fingers, then we'd have flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor digitorum profundus. So one of the, if you're profound, you're deep, so profundus is usually describes the deeper muscles, so one superficial and one profundus. And you have to have two uh, digitorums because you want to be able to flex the fingers at this joint, but you also want to be able to flex the fingers at these joints. So you have to have two different muscles, one that flexes like this, the other one that flexes these, so that we can actually make the fist. Okay. On, on, on our hands. So then the extensors are going to be on our back surface of our hand. So what we are going to see is that we have ones that are going to do the wrist again. So extensor carpi, extensor carpi. And then we're going to use the same pattern. So if it's on the little finger side, then it would be the extensor carpi ulnaris. And then if it's on the thumb side, it's going to be extensor carpi radialis. But that's a paired muscle, and one of them's long, got a long tendon, and one's got a shorter tendon. So we've actually subdivided into extensor carpi radialis brevis, and then extensor carpi radialis longus more at the top. And then again, if it's going to extend the fingers, then we're going to change it from carpi to, to extensor digitorum. And so this, the extensor digitorum is going to actually extend the fingers. So just a cool naming pattern that tells you what's being extended. So the adductors we've already done. So the, the adductors that are on your list are mostly in the thigh with adductor magnus, adductor longus. And then deep adductor longus, adductor brevis would be in, in the thigh itself. So we have a number of levators that we can do. So the one we did in the lab is this big muscle yesterday, which is called the levator ani. If you got into real detailed anatomy, it's actually comprised of two muscles, uh, muscle groups that work to provide the same function. So I tried to simplify it so that we just learn Levator A9, we don't learn these two muscle groups separately. So it's just a simplification. We also have one that would elevate our scapula, so levator scapulae, 
And then we have one that elevates our upper lip, levator levi superioris. So a number of levators that we're actually looking at on our list. So the depressors we looked at yesterday would be this muscle right here, which is, is the one that makes you pout or curls your bottom lip, brings you power, which is depressor levi inferioris. So again, depressors, what to depress, the lip, levi, and where's the muscle found? Inferior to the mouth. So these are all very descriptive, telling you action, telling you what is what part it's interacting with, and location. So all incorporated into the same universe. <coughs> and the supinator is a deep muscle in your elbow region. So to actually find the supinator, then we have to cut some of our superficial muscles away so that we can actually see it. And then it runs at an angle across your your upper, your just below your elbow. So it's the supinator, and it's the muscle that rotates like this. So what I was trying to get you to think about with origin, action, and insertion. So if you know the origin is this, then that gives you origin and insertion. Because this would be where the muscle would have to be attached stationarily then the muscle would have to run across and attach to the radius, which would be its insertion, and that would allow you to rotate the radius around. So that's why action, origin, and insertion are nice to work on together, because they can give you that. So pronator, we actually have a muscle in our, that's more superficial in our elbow that we can actually see called the pronator teres. Uh, and then we have a very deep muscle that's down on your list, but it's at the other end uh, near your wrist, which is called the pronator quadratus. And so the pronator itself, if we think about action, uh, because it's going to roll the radius like this, then <coughs> its origin has to be over here, as fibers have to run in the radius, which would be its insertion. And it's not a it's not a strong enough muscle to actually bring the radius all the way around by itself. So we actually have one down here, where its origin would be on the on the ulna crossing over the radius. And the two pronators together, one pulls on the head region of the radius, one pulls on the, the distal end of the radius. And then both muscles help you rotate your hand like that. So they're both kind of pronators. And then sphincters, uh, like I said, we tend to use ubiquitous for our upper part of the body. So the sphincter we looked at yesterday was the external sphincter, which is skeletal muscle, which is voluntarily controlled again. And that's why babies have to be in diapers, because when, when you're first born, you can't control your external anal sphincter. You have to wait until the brain and skeletal muscle uh, maturate to be able to do that. Uh, and then once you can control your external anal sphincter, then you can control the application. Except if you wait way too long, then the internal anal sphincter takes over. Okay. So the tensor uh, is a little muscle that comes off the anterior iliac uh, spine uh, and then runs down for a short distance. And then it inserts in a really long band of connective tissue, goes clear down to your knee. So the really long band of connective tissue is called the iliotibial tract because of uh, its origination off the ilium here and going to the tibia, so it's crossing the knee. Uh, and so the muscle is called the tensor, fascia latte. So fascia is a word for connective tissue. Latte is lots of fascia. So the muscle is actually telling you that it's tensing a lot of fascia or a lot of connective tissue. And so it, the muscle is right here. And then the IT band goes all the way down here. So in distant runners, sometimes they'll have pain in their knee, and they'll complain of this really bad lateral pain in their knee. But if you actually palpate them right here, the tensor is in the ball, and it's it's uh, actually cramping on them. And so if you can get the tensor to relax, then the pain in the knee will totally go away, because the pain is not being caused by it's just the tension on the tendon <laughs> that is creating the pain. And it's actually this muscle put up in the hip that's actually creating it. So it's common in distant runners to have that, that issue. <coughs> so the number of origins 
Uh, we're going to have a muscle, a couple of muscles called the biceps, uh, one muscle called the triceps, and then the spine muscles, if we think of them all as a group, then they are the quadriceps. So the biceps we have is we have one in the anterior compartment of our arm that has two origins, uh, short head on the coracoid process, and then a long head whose tendon actually goes through the bicipital groove or the intertubecular sulcus of the humerus and goes to the glenoid cavity, and then one insertion on the radial tuberosity. And we have one on the back of our thigh uh, that's actually going to come off of the ischial tuberosity as one head, and then actually the, that's the long head, and then the short head is actually going to come off the back of the femur. Uh, and then it's going to insert on uh, below the knee, and so it's called the biceps femoris, or biceps femoris, and this is the biceps brachii. So both having two heads and then location, one in the brachium, one in the femoral region. So then the muscle on the back of our arm is the triceps. So again, it's going to use, it's actually going to use uh, the idea that's in the brachium again. So on the front we have biceps brachii, and then on the back we have triceps brachii. It actually has three heads, so it has this long head. And the long head is the only one that crosses the shoulder joint, so it originates off the scapula. So it's going to have different actions than the other two, which originate on the humerus, and then they all insert on the lecranon process of the ulna, so that they're involved in extending the forearm. But because this one crosses the shoulder joint, it's also going to have an action uh, at the shoulder joint itself as well. So the long head, this is the lateral head, and then this small piece right here is the medium head. So three heads of, of one muscle, all inserting on the electronic process. So then again, if we think of all of these muscles as one big muscle group, then that's because they all have a common action, uh, which is to extend the knee then the vastus medialis, lateralis, intermedius, and rectus femoris is all are oftentimes called the quadriceps femoris. So some people just call it the quadriceps femoris as a collective muscle group. And then there's all kinds of uh, examples of locations. So frontalis was one we did yesterday on the front, zygomaticus would be one that does location on the zygomatic bone. <coughs> we have a major and minor. So there's a number of muscles that actually utilize uh, location. And then some very specialized muscles, like the masseter, uh, gets its name because of its action of chewing or mastication. So we've got some different patterns to it. So origin and insertion is, is used for a lot of our neck and tongue muscles. So the biggest muscle on the lateral aspect of our neck, its name sternoplatomastoid, is two origins, sternum and clavicle. So the two origins down here. And then it's insertion on the mastoid process. So a good example of origin insertion muscle. And then again, we see it a lot in our tongue muscles. So that we have this bump right here is the genium on the inside of the animal. So genioglossus is the muscle that goes off this and actually goes up to your tongue. And it would protract your tongue and now you stick your tongue out. The muscle that would do the opposite is this one coming off the styloid process and going to your tongue. So it's called styloglossus. And it retracts your tongue. So this one protracts, this one retracts your tongue. And then we have this muscle that comes off the hyoid bone here, goes to the tongue. So it's called the hyoglossus. Then we have a muscle that stabilizes the hyoid bone, arises on the styloid process, and runs to the hyoid bone. So it's referred to as a stylohyoid. So a number of muscles in the deep neck that are all named for origins and insertions. So then our goal is to begin to understand where these muscles are, and then begin to uh, understand origin, action, and insertion for parts of, for part of the
So these are all just pictures that just um, give you examples of where most of the muscles are you are looking for. I did want to say something. So in this unit, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to look at the muscles that are on the outside of the eye. So since the muscles are external to the eye, we say they're intrinsic, extrinsic muscles, excuse me. Then in the next unit, when we talk about how the eye works in terms of your ability to change your pupil and the ability to change your lens shape to go from near to far vision, those muscles are actually within the eye. So we call those intrinsic muscles. And so we're going to see the same thing with the tongue eventually is that we have these extrinsic muscles that we just did that move our tongue around. Then we have intrinsic muscles that allow us to change the shape of our tongue. So within and outside. So the extrinsic muscles, four of them run parallel to the light axis of the eye, so they're all, uh, they're all rectus muscles. So superior rectus, lateral rectus, inferior rectus, and then deep back behind the eye here against the nose would be the medial rectus. Then we have two muscles who, whose insertions are on the back of the eye, so here and here, and they run at angles to these, so these are obliques. So we use inferior oblique for the one below the eye and superior oblique for the one above the eye. So all direction of fibers and directional location of the muscle and incorporating all of the names <laughs> into that. Okay. And then this shows you how they all move the eye. Yeah. Right. So that's kind of an overview of where muscles and names originate. So I think that uh, you know, if you work with that, the muscle names themselves become more meaningful and they help you understand either location muscle, action muscle, uh, or the insertion muscle. And so it becomes a collective body of work. So what I want to do is go ahead and start on lecture two. So the first two labs, we're going to work on, on muscles and where they're located and origin action and insertion. The third lab, we're going to work with some muscle physiology that deals with how muscles work relative to your nervous system. Uh, and so we're going to deal extensively with the skeletal muscles. And then in the fourth lab, we're going to actually look at the characteristics of the three types of muscle that we have in our body. Uh, skeletal muscle, which is the largest muscle group all over your body. Cardiac muscle, which is unique to your heart. And then smooth muscle, which is an internal muscle associated with most ducts in your body, blood vessels, and your digestive system. So what we're going to do to start our conversation in looking at muscles is we're going to look at the three muscle types and look at characteristics of the muscle cell that explain how they kind of function for us. And then we're going to then use skeletal muscle as our model to talk about in more detail how muscles actually work to contract and create the force that allows us to move. And then begin to talk about some unique properties of skeletal muscle as we go forward. So we have skeletal muscle to produce body movement. And that's largely skeletal muscle that is crossing joints and then allows the muscle to create movement at joints. So skeletal muscles work inherently with the joints that we learned in bones, the diarthritic joints that we learned in bones. Uh, and then we have muscles that stabilize body position. So we stand erect all day long, we can set up erect because of muscles that contract against joints. Internally, we use cardiac muscle and smooth muscle to regulate organ volume. So when the heart is relaxed, the heart fills with blood. When cardiac muscle contracts, the heart pumps blood to the rest of your body. And then we actually move things from the point we swallow <laughs> through our esophagus, stomach, large intestine, small intestine, large intestine, by using smooth muscle and move things through our entire digestive system. Our bladder wall expands and expands as our bladder fills with urine. As the bladder wall reaches its point of expansion, it sends signals 
that you need to void, and then smooth muscle is what contracts to allow you to void urine, so regulating the volume of the bladder. And then we use smooth muscle to move substances through our, our body, cardiac and smooth muscle. Again. And then most of our body heat is actually arises from the ability of uh, muscles to produce ATP to create contraction. And in the production of ATP, we generate waste energy. And that waste energy is what we use to maintain body temperature. So muscle mass is critically important to thermal regulation. So if you just look at a broad pattern of people, uh, typically women get cold more easily than men because they have less muscle mass than men. Elderly people, both men and women, women because they lose muscle mass with the aging process, tend to be much colder than younger people and get cold more easily. And it's all based upon muscle mass in the body and the generation of ATP that creates the body temperature that we maintain. So not surprisingly, when you get really cold, you shiver, which causes your skeletal muscles to contract repeatedly, which forces them to make more ATP, thus making more waste energy that's used to heat your body. So that's kind of a basic pattern to see um, when you look at people based upon the production of heat thermal genesis. Okay. So the word thermogenesis, if, if we literally translate it, thermo is a heat, so temperature is a measure of molecular movement molecules, which is what heat is. Genesis is to form, so thermogenesis essentially means to form heat. And so our body does it if we get really cold by shivering thermogenesis. Because our muscles rhythmically contract to make more ATP. That makes sense? <laughs> All right. So the amazing thing about muscles is that we're going to talk about the membrane of muscle cells can convey current, electric current. And we're actually going to change the electric current on muscles to cause them to contract and relax. So not surprisingly, if you come in contact with electricity, all of your muscles contract and stay contracted. So if you actually have a tool that shorted and was shocking to you, you can't let go of the tool because they make all your muscles, it makes your muscles stay contracted. So the one thing that we have to have to make our muscles work is electrical excitability. The way your body works is your brain creates an electric current that it sends out to your muscles via nerves. And then the electric current your brain creates then causes the transfer of that electric current to muscles that make the muscles actually contract. Okay. So we have to have electric excitability. And so we have these electrical impulses that we call action potentials that are generated by nerves. So you can actually, we take it in, we have an instrument we use clinically to look at brain function. So it's called an electrocephalogram. And we actually look at different types of electrical events in the brain itself. But you can take an electrocephalogram and instead of, instead of charting or, or uh, using it to actually create waves that we can look at for diagnostic reasons, you can take the electrocephalogram and put it into an amp and amp the electricity up and then attach it to a toy train and your brain can make a toy train move on a track. And then if you make somebody think harder, then the toy train would go faster. And if somebody is more relaxed, the toy train would go slower. And you just do it simply by catching the electricity off the surface of the, of the skin using that instrument, running it through an amp system, so we're amplifying it and then attaching it to a train. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So, so not only does it have to be electrically excitable, but it has to have contractibility. So the muscles essentially have to be able to go 
from a relaxed state where they're longer to a contracted state where they're shorter. And it's that shortening of skeletal muscle that allows for actions to actually occur at joints. So we have muscles that contract against joints uh, collectively. So when I stand erect, my rectus abdominis muscle is contracting against the front of my ribs. And then my erector spinal muscles in <coughs> the back are contracting against the back of the vertebrae. So the two muscle groups are antagonistic and they're track, contracting against each other. <coughs> so when they contract against each other, they create tension, but they can't shorten. So that type of contraction is called an isometric contraction, <coughs> where no shortening of the muscle occurs. And that's the way most of our postural muscles are actually working. They're creating tension against the bones and stabilizing the bones. Okay. So isometric contractions. So in this instance, my rectus abdominis is doing an isometric contraction. Now, if I convert it to doing an isotonic contraction, which would be a shortening of the muscle, then I'll go from anatomical position and, and be brought forward when the rectus abdominis actually does a isotonic thing. Okay. So when we think about that, those contraction patterns, then most of our postural <laughs> muscles spend all day long during isometric contractions. And then when we want to change body position, we have to do isotonic contractions, which is where the muscle shortens itself. Okay. So unless you want to go around all day like this, and you have to be able to stretch your muscle back out. So the muscle has to have extensibility. It has to be able to be stretched back out without doing internal damage to the muscle. So it has to be stretched without internal damage that damages the muscle. And then uh, it has to have a bit of elasticity which allows it to return to its original shape uh, when it's relaxed. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at three types of, of muscle tissue. We're going to, the muscles we're going to learn in lab are skeletal muscles. The muscle we're going to use as a model for how muscles actually create contractions will be skeletal muscles. Uh, but when we're looking at histology, we're going to use, look at skeletal muscle and contrast how it's put together with cardiac muscle, which is unique to our heart, and then smooth muscle which is associated with our internal organs. And so we'll contrast how they're all constructed. So when we're looking at skeletal muscle, then skeletal muscle is kept in place by associations of connective tissue. And so what we use are different words to describe different types of, of associations of connective tissue. Right. So, if we have a specific connective tissue off of a muscle that goes to a unique place, then we call it a tendon. So, so for example, this is ridge right here is a tendon. Now, what's interesting is that if everybody looked at their wrist, there are some people that do not have this tendon. So. There's a little muscle in our forearm called the palmaris longus, and not everybody has that muscle. So when you look at some people's wrists, this center tendon is not there. They actually lack it. And that's a unique tendon in that it connects the palmaris longus to the palmar fascia. And so it's one of the muscles that helps us flex. So does anybody not have this tendon right here? So. Like, it goes right here? Yeah, if you just make a fist, it stands out. Central tendon. <coughs> yeah, it's, it's a dinky little muscle. The muscle's only about this big. It's clear up in your elbow, and it has this really long tendon. So the, the, if you look at physics and you look at the force the muscle can create, it only helps initiate the flexion. They can't do the complete flexion. So that's where the flexion is. So anyway, that's, that's just an example. So those would be tendons, those unique connections. So if we have really broad sheets of connective tissue that are associated with muscle, 
the most common word we could use is fascia. So if you're if you went to the grocery store, you bought a round steak, uh, which is actually a cut of meat through the thigh <coughs> of an animal. Then it'll have a cut through the diaphysis of the bone at the center, so a round bone with uh, with yellow marrow on the inside. So then, if you cook that steak whole without taking any subunits apart, then parts of it would be really chewy and what we would call bristle. That is, flashed. And that's interconnecting the muscles together. So if you subdivide all the muscle out of it, and then you cut all that fascia off, then it's much easier to chew. Right? And then the really broad one that goes over the top of our head is called an apodermosis. We're also going to have an apodermosis associated with our abdomen anteriorly, an apodermosis on the back. Those are another word for a broad chi of connection. So fascia is more general, aponeurosis is a little more specific. Right. So what happens with a muscle is that we have to have connective tissue that attaches the muscle to its origin. We have to have connective tissue that attaches the muscle to its insertion. And then the fibers have to be somehow connected to that connective tissue so that when the fibers contract, they transfer, transfer the internal shortening of the bone <laughs> to the tendon, which transfers the force to the bone, so we actually create movement. So if you actually just had muscles with tendon at the end, then we would tear our tendons all the time, because that wouldn't be a very strong attachment. So what we have to do is we have to have a continuum of connective tissue from the tendon of origin to the tendon of insertion in which the muscle fibers exist so that the force being created can't pull the tendons off the muscles. Right. And so that's the, way our, our, that's the way our muscles are actually constructed. So what we use is we use prefixes that are descriptive of location. So epi, above, peri, around, and endo, within, as a description of these connective tissues. So there's a prefix we use a lot relative to muscle. And so my is, a, is, is something that we would see associated with muscle. Myo is another way that we could see it. So if we wrote, we could write muscle cell, and that requires two words, or we could say more technically, myocyte. And so myo is muscle, site is cell, so myocyte. So myo is a word that's incorporated into things uniquely associated with muscle. So the connective tissue itself has my in its name. So epi, my, peri, my, endo, my. So that's telling us it's associated with muscle. And then the ending, um, is associated with a sheet of connective tissue. So epi, my, sium, peri, my, sium, endo, my, sium. So the epi, my, sium is what's on the surface of the muscle. That's why on the cadavers, we can actually separate muscles from one another. Because each muscle is uniquely bound to the outside as a unit by the epimycin. So this sheet of uh, connective tissue right here that's going all the way around the muscle, this white thing right here, is the epimycin. And that keeps the muscle as a unique unit. And then all of the muscle cells are bound by that epimycin into the muscle itself. Now, the way muscles work is that we have to be able to do different amounts of contraction. So if I only want to flex my wrist part way versus all the way, I have to be able to do that because muscle cells cannot do a partial contraction. So if I stimulate a muscle cell, 
the muscle cells either going to contract fully or not contract. So there is no such thing as a partial contraction of a muscle cell. So what I have to do is create a muscle by making units of muscle cells that work together as a unit. So that if I want to contract my muscle partly, I would only use one of the units in the muscle and not all of the units in the muscle. But if I want to contract my muscle fully, I would engage all the units in the muscle. So a subunit of a muscle is a fascicle. So a fascicle is a group of muscle cells that make up part of a muscle. And so what keeps a fascicle together as a unit is the perimycin. So the epimycin is around the entire muscle. Perimycin is around a muscle subunit that we call a fascicle. And that allows us to do partial contractions. And we're going to get more precise on this with some terminology as we go along. Uh, and so this represents one fascicle, this represents another fascicle, this represents another fascicle. So this connective tissue within here is the perimycin. Now, for our brain to actually have very defined control of muscle activity, every muscle cell has its own connection to the nervous system. And every muscle cell then is isolated from neighboring cells so that each muscle cell can work independently in terms of its contractibility. So each muscle cell itself is surrounded by an internal membrane called the endomuscle. So epi surrounds the entire muscle. Peri surrounds fascia. Endomycin surrounds muscle cells or muscle fibers. Right, so, so this is a fascicle. This is an individual cell. This is an individual cell. So the tissue around this is the endomycin. So we're going to look at that in lab using a microscope to look at skeletal muscle tissue. All right. So let's kind of make sense out of what we, we've just been talking about in relationship to this is actually a round state. This one, you couldn't buy the first store because it's a human round state. But it's a round state, all right? And so when you would buy one, you would get a cross-section through the femur here. And you get different muscles that um, make it up. And so these broad sheets of connective tissue running through here where blood vessels are found and stuff would be called fascia. The individual muscle sheets of connective tissue that are separating like the adductor brevis here from the adductor longus would be the epimycin. If you look at this big muscle, the adductor magnus, you can see that this is a part of a muscle, this is a part of a muscle. You can see these dark grooves here. That would be a fascicle, that would be a fascicle, that would be a fascicle. So what we would find in these dark grooves right here would be the perimycin. And then individual muscle cells, we can't see just with our naked eye. But if we could see individual muscle cells, what would isolate each muscle cell from one another would be the endomycin. So that's putting it into context with what you can see with your naked eye. This is actually putting it into context with what we can see with the microscope. And so, this is a fascicle, and so this connecting tissue here, separating this fascicle from this fascicle, would be the perimycin. Fascicles are made up of muscle cells. These are all individual muscle cells. And so why is separating this cell from this cell, this cell from this cell? Because this connecting tissue right here, and so that would be the endomycin. So it's a hierarchical organization of separation using uh, connective tissue. Mm -hmm. All right. so, so what I'd like to do is begin to think about how muscle cells are constructed. 
And first of all, I always think muscle cells are so cool, because they just basically uh, do away with everything that you learn probably in general biology about a cell. Where a cell is this small entity with a nucleus at the center and a bunch of cytoplasm. You throw that all out the window because muscle cells are constructed in, in a unique way. So to begin with, one of the longest muscles in our body is the sartorius. And so the sartorius comes off the anterior superior iliac spine and goes to the tibia right here. So the muscle itself is about that long. And the cells go from the origin to the insertion. So the cell is that long. So muscle cells are incredibly long cells. They, they aren't those little round things that we looked at when we looked at squamous cells and cuboid cells and columnar cells at all. They're the giant cells that extend from the tendon of origin to the tendon of insertion. So there are these incredibly long cells that are constructed like cylinders. So they're very cylindrically, very long cells. So long cylindrical cells. And what happens is, embryologically, a bunch of small cells fuse together to make this big cell during embryonic development. And all the nuclei are retained. So the next thing we've got to throw out the window is what you learned in general biology that there was only a single nucleus per cell. And skeletal muscle cells are multi-nuclear. They could have thousands of nuclei. So what happens is that the way in which the fusion occurs within a skeletal muscle cell, it leaves a pattern of arrangement that makes it under the microscope look like it has a dark band with a light band in between, dark band with a light band. So when we look at the entire muscle cell itself, we see this pattern where we have a dark band, light band, dark band, light band, dark band, light band. Now what we're eventually going to do is we're going to call the bands, the dark bands A bands. And we're going to call the light bands in between the I bands. So it's a repeat pattern of A band, I band, A band, A band. And that, that's related to the fusion of many small cells during embryonic development that created the cell. So what we say is because it has this repeated pattern of uh, light and dark band that it's striated. And then it's going to be composed of a subunit, which is a functional unit. And the subunit goes from the middle of one I band to the middle of the next I band. And so what we use is a word called a sarcomere. So composed of sarcomeres. So sarco is again uniquely used for something associated with muscle. The ending mere is what we use as a reference to uh, some embryonic activity or tissue. So when you were one cell after conception, you went to two cells and then eventually four cells as you progress toward being multicellular. These early cells were called blastomeres. So when we did when we did connective tissue, this part of the cell was incorporated into the cell. The tell you it was an immature cell, chondroblast, osteoblast. And so what we're doing here with sarcomere is just using this ending to tell us that this pattern uh, is based upon the embryonic development of the cell itself. So we have these sarcomeres. And sarcomeres are going to become the functional unit of the cell. It's, it's the point where contractions actually occur. Right? 
So when we looked at a cell historically, then we had these cells, and we, we noticed that there were some inner, internal membranes that all had ribosomes on it. So those internal membranes were ribosomes we called Roth endoplasmic region. So we had R, ER, Roth endoplasmic region. Then we noticed in other cells there was this folded membrane stuff, but it didn't have ribosomes associated. So we called that smooth ER. Cells, skeletal muscle cells, have ER that is organized based upon this circle mirror appearance. And so it has patterns to it. And what it does is it stores calcium. So since it's unique, it's not actually making lipids like smooth ER, and it's not actually making proteins like rough ER, then we call it sarcoplasmic telling us it's unique to muscle, so sarcoplasma, and in reticulum. And so sarcoplasmic reticulum is unique for calcium storage. And to make a muscle contract, we have to have adequate calcium levels. There is not actually enough calcium in your blood at any point in time to effectively make a muscle cell contract. So muscle cells have to store calcium internally to accomplish the feat of a contraction. Right? So that's what the sarcoplasmic reticulum is, is a network of endoplasmic reticulum uniquely designed to store calcium. Now muscle cells themselves are not only big cylinders in terms of how long they are, but they're also very large in diameter. So they're giant cells in so in the first unit, we talked about surface-to-volume phenomena and how the size of a cell is limited by its increase in volume, which occurs at a much greater rate than the surface area. So we kind of went through that in the first unit. Well, in fact, muscle cells have a significant problem with surface-to-volume ratio. And their surface area is just not adequate to make sure that we can get enough carbon dioxide, oxygen exchange, and other things. So what we have to do, if that's the case, if volume is too great, we have to have a way of increasing surface area. So what would be a good way of increasing surface area if we can't make the cell smaller or bigger? Folds, yeah. That's what we saw in the past. So what we actually have in skeletal muscle are these downward folds of membrane toward the center. So that now we've just greatly increased the surface area of the cell itself. And those are called transverse tubules. So these downward folds are called T tubules. That greatly increase the surface area. And then that's critically important to the, what we're going to talk about and that needs to happen on a, on a skeletal muscle cell to actually establish a contraction is that we increase the surface area phenomenally. Right. So the other thing that we talked about in, lecture, in unit one was that cells were held tightly together in epithelium. And we had some, we had these ways in which cells can be held together where their cytoplasma goes between the cells. So those were called gap junctions. Well, skeleton muscle cells have no gap junctions. So every cell is totally isolated from other cells. And I'm <laughs> <laughs> so excited about it. I mean,